I, I'm calling this Yaps because I, to me, Steve Johnson was my favorite person in the whole world. He wrote PCC, the Portable C compiler. Um, he wrote Yak, yet another compiler compiler. Uh, and he was very kind to me. When I first joined Bell Labs, I did a, um, an independent study with them doing um, coloring algorithm, algor uh, and coloring uh, algorithm optimization for register allocation that someone at IBM Yorktown had done for their, Chris, their risk compiler that actually outperformed the IBM mainframe, which was very embarrassing to IBM at the time. And that's when um, the risk compilers and Sun basically came. And, and it, it really required writing fast compilers. And so I was working on the, the paper. And you know I got it to work, but it didn't work, if you know what I mean. I mean, I got it to work where it was acceptable, but it wasn't really doing anything that was useful in a production environment. And I felt terrible about it, because I, I just felt terrible about it. And I wrote this little note that was just so apologetic. And, and he was very nice, because I had never been in a competitive, alpha-driven computing environment before. I, I, was, I came from fine arts. And that's why I like the, the, P, uh, the P8 guy who wrote the coloring algorithm, because he always had an English degree. Um, but in any case, um, and Steve said, you know, you, you can't apologize or feel bad. You just have to suck it up and deal with what you've done. And if any of you have ever used C++, you know that it is, it is complicated and bug-ridden. Every compiler breaks, right, at some point. So you just, it, it's a hard lesson. If you write compilers or if you write software, you just know that everything breaks and fails. There's not one piece of software that I've used in my life that's still being used. OK? Excuse me? Yeah, I stopped. Barbara still uses it, Barbara Moo. But I, I stopped using it. Yeah, I just mean, but I mean, but latex isn't considered. I mean, a few people still use it because it's Knuth and it's a, it was, you know, but I, I prefer t rough to LaTeX. Um, you know, and I could still use t rough um, But, you know, you could only use t rough if you knew Brian because, no, uh, do you know how you get rid of an extra space in, in t rough Because, you know, sometimes because it, you, you, may, you make a, uh, even with for code, it'll add an extra space on either side that looks awful. And the only way you can get rid of it in TRUF is use a backslash and, and another odd character. I mean, it's not documented anywhere, and you'd never figure it, out, figure it out. So you just have to know someone who knows it, which is, is a bizarre way of working. Um, so this is my talk. Um, I, I make. No apologies for it, but I will apologize if it at all is incomprehensible or unsatisfying to people. Uh, feel free to just scream out anything you want. I don't mind, um, as long as your neighbor doesn't mind. And uh, I, I think I can get through all the foils. I have this, just because I like it, bizarre little thing. You know, if it's really upsetting to people, I can stop. Uh, but you know, that was, that's, you know, I mean, I, I, when I first started in computing, you know, we had those Tektronic graphic, I mean, it was graphics, you know, you had to do your own lines. You couldn't, you know, and you had to do anti-aliasing, and now it's all like just built in, etc. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm, I'm sort of stunned at how long I've been aware of C++. Um, I was first introduced in 1983. I joined um, the labs as a tester. The reason I got in was because I was the only one willing to admit that I knew both C and COBOL. And they needed a, 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 someone who could test their COBOL syntax, syntax checker, um, which was written in C. So I was, you know, First introduced by Jerry Schwartz, who implemented the IO Stream library. So you should all be familiar, if not with Jerry, with his work. And at the time, he was designing Nail, which again is not another intermediate language. 
uh, under Steve Johnson, who moved from research into development and wanted to redo the compiler lab to make it a, a um, to have a backbone that was an intermediate language in which all the, all the tools were written against the intermediate language, not the um, uh, front ends. And everything was being written in C++, which Bjarne was at best in a beta situation. So it, it was pretty impossible to use a language that was under beta testing, and he was the only developer at the time, with people who weren't familiar with it writing an ADA compiler, a Fortran 77 compiler, a C++ compiler, and, and some other things that are no longer languages. Uh, so the thing failed miserably, and, and Steve was actually forced to leave Bell Labs and, and was actually stripped of his fellowship. They really treated him badly, in my opinion. But. And then in 1985, they decided to release Seafront, release 1.0. We made it a brown bag release, meaning that it was Bjarna, myself, uh, Rob Murray, who did the munch and, and um, patch, which were ways of porting it to different compilers, uh, different target machines, uh, including things like the CDC, all, all these strange machines that nobody knew how to really deal with, even Cray. Um, I got to join, I always wanted to go in the compiler group, because right? the only thing I ever wanted to do was write compilers. And I got to join the group in 86 under Steve Johnson. And I, was, I wanted to join um, Steve's uh, Portable C, C2 group under Dave Crystal, and I was going to do the code generating part. And Barbara Moo, who I was friends with, and she had worked at, uh, on uh, the F77 compiler and then became a supervisor, convinced me that I should work on Seafront. Because I like back-end stuff, actually, more than front-end. Because front-end is all heuristics, except for the grammar. Um, and then, you know, we, so from 1.8, from 86 to about middle of 2.0, I was the only one working on Seafront. And because it was the standard, which everyone else had to conform to, even though they grumbled about it, for, for a, a brief period of time, like four or five years, I knew more. There were like four people that understood how to compile C++. And oddly enough, I, I knew a lot, uh, which always surprised me. And, and I added things to the language. I, I know, you know, because what happens is, like, you have parameters, right? You have int a equals 1, comma, int b equals a. And you have an int a at global scope, and then you have int a at parameter scope. Now, no one agreed at which a that should refer to. So, and I, I would never go to beyond it. I mean, the point of working at Bell Labs is you don't ask people what to do. Right. You, you always, in fact, if you want to ever do anything with Bjarne, you don't ask him a question, you provide him with a solution, and then if he doesn't like it, he'll, he'll fix it. But if you just ask him a question, you know, people don't, don't deal well with that. So, um, so, so that was my glory years. I was completely over my head. I was the only one supporting Seafront for all of the development group. Most of the time I had no idea what they were talking about. Guys like Steve Baroff, I mean, really, really smart, or Jerry, would come up with these bizarre problems. And they would ask, they, they wanted me to fix it and also explain everything. And back then, we didn't even uh, hide the ma uh, mangled name. So when, you, when your function didn't work, you'd just see the internal name, which, which was rather hor horrific to them. Wow. Um, and then I, I was, I ended up doing the template implementation. Um, it was a blessing and a curse. The way things work is Bjarne would make a deal with somebody, and then he would just dump it on you and tell you about it. So um, I ended up getting an implementation of classes, a real simple one, uh, written by a bunch of Lisp people that were stuck writing C++ because Lisp and Smalltalk just didn't have a, an audience that could um, sponsor um, 
work. I mean, you couldn't really do interesting things with either list with small talk after, after the, about 1990. Um, so I did templates. And one of the hard things is once people start using it, they won't let you change it. So, so, uh, so the two things that were really hard about it is they implemented all their um, tree walking by using cutter and car, you know, the, the, the list thing, which I never quite understood. I, I mean, I had taken lists. I'd taken artificial intelligence and used lists, but not, you know, and I liked it. Uh, and, you know, like I, I got my whole uh, semester's project done in, 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 in a 36-hour period. I just sat at the terminal and banged it out, and it was good enough. So, you know, there's lots to be said about those kinds of languages, but you can't really use them in a production environment. Um, after that, I left to intern in Area 11. Bjarne was doing a Grail project, and I implemented the object model component. That's the component that takes the higher level C++ constructs and translates them into the machine representation, basically C and other representation. So it, it's a, it's basically it's a, like a projection from 3D onto a 2D plane. Um, and I, I was also editor of the C++ report, uh, and I, I signed on a lot of people. The thing I always wanted to do with the C++ report was to irritate the people at Bell Labs. So I always, like, I got Scott, who Bjorn and Andy didn't like at the time. I got Don Box, because he worked in Windows and it was obnoxious. Tom Cargill wrote a thing called the C++ Gadfly. He once gave a talk, a keynote talk, at, a, at the second C++ conference, uh, in which he said, if you want to add a particular feature to C++, you should be required to take one out. And, and that didn't go along, go over very well. Um, and then in 2001 to 2005, I was an architect at Visual C++. Uh, but I chose to work exclusively with C++.net. I didn't even, I, to be honest, I wanted to work on C Sharp or work on .net. But Microsoft wouldn't let me do that. Um, so instead, I worked on .net. And I, I, I worked on the initial redesign of the managed C++ release. Uh, and I wrote a C, MC++ to C++ CLI translator, which it has to translate all of C++, which I called MC Front, and I, I convinced Microsoft to let it be available for free at the time. Oh, not going to work. So that's just, that's my little history. Uh, The, the, the part that really was important is once the Grail project was, was canceled because of po politics, um, I went into industry. One of the things that basically language designers, be it Bertrand, Mus Russ, uh, Bertrand Myers or Bjarne or the people that did small talk, well, not small talk, but... Um, one of the problems with most compiler or language designers is they don't use the language to do anything other than possibly write the compiler. But they don't really understand what it means to have to get something to work. I mean, at Disney, I worked on a $200, $200 million movie, Dinosaurs. So, you know, if it doesn't work, that's really significant. Um, and it's just so... So basically, I worked in animation, which is, you know, high-end stuff. I worked at JPL. I worked on it. They have a wonderful framework for the Mars rover called Clarity that's freely available. It's a, it's, it's a framework, and it's, it's modularized so that if you're a researcher and you, you want to do Im, uh, object detection, you can swap out the existing model, a, a module, which is basically just for rocks, because there's no water. There's nothing else on Mars except rocks and sand and craters. Um, and you could put in something as you want. And, and it does that like throughout the, um, the entire framework. And that's freely available. And I worked on some other pieces. Uh, and then I was in massive multiplayer online game companies. So I, I, you know, I, I always like to work with really large complex systems where, where performance is really significant. 
and where there's no rules. I, I really don't work well with rules. I mean, if, if you know how to do something, you shouldn't ask me to do it because if you know how to do it, I'm not a good person to do it. I'm good at doing things that you don't know how to do yet. Um, so, so that's my career. And um, to be honest, I, I haven't used C++ in almost five years. I've, I, I like iOS, which, you know, I, I have to like Android too, of course. But uh, the problem with Android is, in my well, I'm not going to even say that. But I, I, you know, at the time, no, I'm not going to say it. I, I'm, I'm trying to be a, a good person. Uh, but I really like the iPad, and I really like mobile computing. You know, and I used to have a Lego Mindstorm, so I really like sensors and 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 figuring out what's going on in the environment and building things up from scratch. Um, and basically all I've been doing lately is studying molecular biology and neuroscience, in particular memory and sleep. Um, I don't read books about coding anymore. I, I had a choice. I could either read Andre's book. This was back in whenever Andre's book came out. And I just thought, you know, I don't want to know any of this anymore. I, I just, at a certain level, it just doesn't seem interesting to me. Um, and I don't make a living doing this anymore. Do, do you know what I mean? I mean, I have expertise in C++, but I, I, feel, I would feel really bad spending the rest of my life doing that. Um, and that's not what this is. What I'm trying to do, and failing badly, is I'm trying to write an e-novel. I, I, I'm really tired of Gutenberg. You know, I really don't want a linear story in, in pages. Uh, and so I, and, and most people, if you, if you look at the iPad, most things that are being published as multimedia are just, you're just taking a book and you're just seeing which parts you can make something else. And it's really totally uninteresting, in my opinion. Because they're not really thinking from the bottom up. They're just trying to get something to work as quickly as possible. So I'm trying to reinvent basically literature. Um, and I'm trying to, I was starting to, and I'm trying to do it on iOS, only because it's there. Um, and so for me, to, to play on the games of synchronization and concurrency, I feel like I've, I'm, I, I am going on a concurrent path with C++ now. And I'm using this as a sort of sync point so that you know what I'm doing and I get to know what you guys are doing. And, and that's really as far as I would go with this talk. I'm not going to make any further claims. Okay. Ta-da. Now, this bug has been in the iPhone since the original release of the iPhone back at least five years or six years now. You see what's wrong, right? The temperature is 112, and yet the high and low are 111 and, and 79. So you would think that's a simple fix, right? But, but it, it's not. Nobody's fixed it. And so I was trying to think of why aren't they fixing it? And, and it's, it seems clear to me that the reason they're not fixing it is because they're getting the data from two different streams or modules. One of the streams has to be um, static. It's basically the, the weather people probably simply project the high and low for, for an entire week. And then they're getting this guy from an actual real time, or not real time, but you know, you, you can uh, pull it and you, you pull the thing down. And so then the question is, well, in any normal piece of code, you would simply add a condition that would say, if the high, if the high temperature is higher than the high, bump it up to that or else. But you can't do that if you have two different streams. Right? It would require a completely different architecture of what they're doing. And it's not worth it, right? Because nobody cares. 
But, but the problem is, is this is a trivial example. <coughs> but the problem is, is that these, these designs are totally intractable. You can't work with them. And this is a trivial example, but it's wrong. So imagine something that's really complex. And how many bugs must be in that that are intractable? I remember once I was working at Disney, and I, I read code. I never trust programmers, because programmers will never tell you the truth about their code, either because they don't know it, or else because they don't want you to know. And, and one of the hardest things to do in C++ is to return a class object that you're, you're allocating on the stack, right? Meaning, you know, inside a function, right? It's, so, so who's going to control it? Who's going to own it? How are you going to know when to destroy it? And all that kind of stuff. So he just decided he couldn't figure that out. And so he just returned this guy. And it was going to die when the function died, right? And he just punted on it. And you can't do that, you know, in real life. You can do that in college. You can get away with that in school. You can get away with that in research. But you can't do that in a production environment where you're just a service person, right? I mean, what I like about industry is I was never an important person. The important people were animators. My job was simply to make the code work so the animators could get their job. And that means you have to be, and it's the same with compilers, right? Everyone curses a compiler when it does something wrong because there's nothing you can do. And Bjarne always used to say, we spent an entire day once, Bjarne and I, trying to figure out where in Yak we could add an error message that's saying, this can't be right. Did you possibly put a semicolon where you meant a colon or something like that? And we spent the whole day just so we could help the user. And then we decided it was too hard because of, of, of the way Yak is. So, um, so we just gave it up. But, but there's always the sense that it's better for the person writing the software to work harder so that the people using the software don't have to do the work. The thing that infuriates me about a lot of the code people use is it's so complicated to explain. If you have to be so complicated to explain it to a user, you know they're going to make mistakes. And they can't keep it in their head. And so the thing that I'm interested in is how do you explain a complex system in a simple way that doesn't distort it? For example, it's easy to say, DNA goes to RNA goes to protein. Everybody that goes to college now knows that. But the fact is that none of that is true. If that was true, then the fact that a yeast has as many genes as a human wouldn't work. The fact is, is that the way the code deals with complexity, the life code, is by taking a gene and allowing it to generate multiple genes through various away, uh, uh, ways, including uh, RNA microarrays. So you can get from one gene in a human or a higher mammal, from one gene you could get like 14 or 15 different genes based on environmental condition. But you can't explain that without going into a lot of detail. And as soon as you go into a lot of detail, people don't want to listen, right? Because it's hard. But, so, but that's a real problem because the more we become, or it's the same with C++. I, I've sat in a few of the talks. Someone was talking about ABI compatibility, which is a very hard problem. And when you listen to the person give the list of rules, you realize no one's going to walk out of that talk with any sense of what you do. And it's just going to be hard for everyone. And, and you know, that, we tried to do that 20 years ago, and they're still trying to do it, so it's not working. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but if, if you're talking about the same thing 20 years from when we first looked at them, that's not good. I, I, it's just not. I mean, my kids grew up. My son was born after we realized that ABI compatibility was never going to happen. 
So, so with that preface, I, I'm going to give you a, if you want to introduce a new paradigm, the first thing you have to do is get rid of the old. Now, the way you do, usually do it in, 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 in the, you know, ever since Algo, is you simply attack the languages you want to get rid of. They called Fortran an 800 pound gorilla. They called it graffiti being written on a bathroom wall, which means they're calling it excrement, right? Um, you get that what Knuth called COBOL, and COBOL programmers, uh, again, in, uh, you know, an expletive. Um, Bertrand Myers used to say, why settle for a C when you can get an A plus? And uh, Richard Gabriel, who I love, called C programmers, uh, again, it was a political analogy to, uh, to an ethnic slur, literally. So, so it, it's really nasty when people talk about other languages. So I didn't want to do that. So this is my, my talk. But basically, what I'm, what I'm trying to convince you is, is that any of you under 40 that are coding in C++ really want to rethink your, your decision. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so I didn't want to do all the work. So here's my question for you. What language did the first Digital computer use. Well, almost digital computer. It was, it was, I believe it was ENIAC. And so, you know, it wasn't digital because it used um, those tubes. And their biggest concern at the time was how could we do arithmetic because those tubes were burning out so quickly. And that was one of the main things. So was it a binary machine code, a hex octo machine code, which are really the same, just with groupings, an assembly language? or C++, because C++ is old. <laughs> exactly. There wasn't any language, oddly enough. Uh, the idea of an independent program, let alone the idea of a programming language, hadn't been part of the original invention. Cables were plugged in. And, and the plugging in of the cable set the configuration for a particular algorithm. Most of them were for ballistics, for, because it was World War II, for dealing with ordnance. And, and, uh, and I'm just going to hand wave at that point. Um, or you just manually reconfigured it. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure that's where tight coupling became a, uh, a, an idea in, in software. Now, the main point I want to make is programmers, programs dwell in a computational environment. They're, they're the product of a particular technology, right? The modern computer era began without the concept of either a program or a programming language. Um, it was not thought of a, as symbolic program notation. There was no concept of inventing a language. And there was no idea that we'd all be sitting here making a very good living writing code, right? I, I always say to myself, if they didn't have computers, I wouldn't know what, to, what I would have done with myself. I, I tend to be not very good socially. I like to sit alone and work on complicated problems. And uh, there aren't that many things you can do for it. You could be an accountant. I could, that's what my mother wanted for me, is to be an accountant. Uh, so the immediate intractable problems were hardware. In particular, they had a base 10 representation of math. And they had to get those, those tubes, vacuum tubes, to stay long enough to get a result, because they tended to blow out too fast. Um, You know, that, I, you know, that's really a wonderful technology. We take things for granted. But, but that, that was really hard to get canned like that. Um, so the introduction of the program solved logistical bottlenecks of the pre-existing computational environment. The trade-off is always going to be faster automatic loading of the program. You don't have to go and, and do all the cables. 
But you have to implement a software abstraction layer. And each time you implement a software abstraction layer, two things happen. You get a latency between the actual behavior and the behavior that you're going to see. And you have a whole area of bugs that are specialized to a, 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 a um, domain that very few people actually understand, right? They're just making it up on the fly. And, and so it's going to keep changing. Everyone OK with this? You can argue if you want. But you see, most of you won't be able to argue because you've never probably thought of things like this. Uh, one of the, the nice things and the sad things about computer science is it has such a short history, and most of the people are still alive, that we should embrace the history of computer science. But everybody's so busy with what's new that they don't, we always devalue anything that's old, you know, like Fortran. What's wrong with Fortran? Fortran was one of the great things that was done, but it was done in the 1950s. You know, so now we don't, we don't care about it. But, but if we don't value what has gone before, then when you people get old, no one's going to value you. You know, and I, I can't tell you how many bitter people I've met. I, I, when I worked at Microsoft, I got to go to computer science departments. And I was at one in either I, in places where I, I couldn't even get, get enrolled. So I was either at MIT or Harvard. And there was this guy in the first row that was so angry because he invented a language like in the 1960s. And it's completely dead, and no one had ever heard of it. But to him, it was his life work. And he at least wanted it to be acknowledged as having existed. And I didn't know what to say. I said, well, yeah, I know. It's, it's cool to write a language. But you know, if it's not used, what are you going to do? Even Clue, which is considered a high-level grand language, only had 11 sites that it's most useful. Um, OK, so software did not begin as software. It was hardwired. I dance without a separate dance notation. Um, then it evolved into a reproducible bitmap. It was purely a numeric representation. The assembler was a big fight. Um, the, the woman, uh, Grace, uh, Grace Hopper, had a huge fight to get assembly language accepted. And that was because people felt it was taking you too far from the machine. How could you abstract the machine code and use acronyms? So, you know, and it was a fight, and nobody thought they could really do it. And so she got the mnemonic representation. And then, you know, like with Fortran, they kept scaling back because they knew they had to be able to compile it quickly and get it to be relatively correct. Everything is relative with computers, uh, unless, or it would be rejected. So, you know, at the beginning of history, there was always a fight against abstraction and representation beyond the machine. The benefit of, benefit of it is it lets more people do the work, right? The simpler the language, the more people can do it. And, and that's good and bad. You know, but um, again, at each stage, the more software complexity that's introduced between the program and the machine, the more time it takes to do things, the harder it is to figure out where things go wrong, and, and the more um, confusion there is when things do go wrong. I, I you know, like both at um, Microsoft and, and within AT&T when we were doing Unix, there was always the fight between the compiler groups and the uh, operating system on who was breaking whom. Because we'd be writing the new compiler, and they'd be writing the new operating system. And when something went wrong, you never exactly knew what the cause of it was. So again, uh, taking an evolutionary view of programming languages, programming languages are a response to a particular computational environment. Fortran, Algo. I mean, how many people? know anything about reference by name, which was real famous for Algo. 
Right, you're probably from computer science, right? Uh, but that was a real big issue at the time. Um, and then C was a big renegade by having passed by value. That was considered really stupid. If you went to an academic conference, people just laughed at C. Um, but in any case, it facilitates expressions within a current environment and improves on an existing problem set, right? We know how to solve existing problems, but we don't know what problems we're going to introduce by our solutions. So you always have something that comes in and solves all these problems and everyone's happy. And then once it starts to be used and we get rid of the other things and dismiss them as, 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 as old and tired, we suddenly discover all these new problems. Uh, you know, you get the Windows API, which became the sausage string of hundreds of thousands of functions. But now, look at, if you look at .NET, it's impossible to figure out what classes there are anymore. There's no way to really browse them or find them or even keep them in, a, in your mind's eye. But what it does do is it provides a vocabulary and shared point of view. So suddenly cultures grow up out of it. So you have people that are Fortran programmers or people that are C programmers, and they hate the other people. Even in Microsoft, there was basic, and those people were called Mort. I don't know why they did that. And then there was C Sharp, and those were Elvis. And C++, C++ were called Einstein. And, and notice the 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 valuation of that, right? Mort means, well, we're blue collar and we're not very smart, so we have to dumb everything down. In .NET, if you look at the original implementation of their collections, they made bad decisions because they felt that the basic programmer wouldn't be able to handle more advanced computer science concepts. And, and they always said, well, Elvis, everyone likes Elvis. But Einstein, we're not Einstein. So, you know, like Microsoft now is an Elvis company. Uh, you know, and he's, they're wearing their white suit and they're, they're a little overweight. <laughs> Did you, I, 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 have, I have these, uh, I have these people that write in Arabic on my Facebook. And every now and then they have a translation phase, you know, thing you can hit. And, and they're all by Bing. And none of the translations are at all coherent in English. Uh, I mean, which is fine, you know, like translation is really hard. You know, that was where AI, AI in the 50s claims they could write, you know, immaculate trans, translations things and, and they were huge failures. AI always makes these huge claims they get all the funding and then they fail. And then they go back and then they come back and say, oh no, we got it right this time. Do you know, in the 1990s, all these AI people said, well, if you would just do this, this, and this to the language, give us multiple inheritance and we'll, we'll use C, C++, and everything will be fine. And all those companies failed. Um, but we gave them MI, which was a big mistake, right? The two biggest mistakes, in my opinion, was doing MI, because virtual base classes were wrong, right? The interfaces are 100 times better than MI, virtual inheritance. Because with virtual inheritance, you don't know where the virtual base class is going to be. It changes down the inheritance line. And, and it's just, I mean, it ruined everything, right? It ruined of the implementation by Microsoft, they, they actually copyrighted having a virtual base class pointer, which is the wrong decision in any case. Mike uh, Tiemann came up with a much better solution, was to have the virtual base table have back, you know, be backward and forward. So the backward, if it grew backwards, that was pointers to the virtual base class. And if it grew forward, that was the pointers to the virtual base, uh, the virtual tables. The, the problem with uh, having a virtual base class is then you have to initialize it at runtime because you don't know what the offset is. And that's when Bjarne introduced a static initialization of global objects, which still isn't deterministic, 
right? So it's, it's a serious bug. They spent at least two years in the original standards committee trying to resolve it, and then they just gave up. And they still, according to my understanding, in C++11, they still don't know how to solve that problem. And it was a hasty decision. So, why is this a problem? All languages become extinct. And as computer professionals, that means that none of you are going to be programming, except for people like myself and, and the older people here, all of us are going to have to change our languages. And we're going to have to deal with changing technology that just accelerates. And it makes it really hard. Because what happens is, whenever, in an in, whenever you're in a company, if you want to advance yourself, what you have to do is you have to unseat the people that have the positions you want. The best way to do that is to introduce new technology. When you introduce new technology, you obsolete the people that are ahead of you, and you become the new experts. Okay? So there's a real problem as soon as you become expertise in any technology, because you're also a human being that has a family and a mortgage and a lifestyle. Um, so, as comp computational environments change, the more specialized the language to the previous computational environment, the less adaptive it proves to the new environment. The historical acumen uh, of structure seems to overwhelm these efforts. The conditions that give rise to a language tend to lead to its eventual extinction. As, as uh, Richard Dawkins likes to say about species, there are many, many more extinct uh, than active programming languages. We could, we could fill books and books with programming languages that are no longer used. And when people come up and say, oh, well, there's Ruby, or there's D, or now there's E, or there's F, I mean, are we going to keep doing that? You know, because it's always advancing someone's career. I don't mean to, you know, if you can invent a new language, you can become a great man. Right? If you become a great man, you, you, you acquire great resources. You can tell people, get out of here. I mean, do you know how many people I've seen fired because they've upset somebody that's more important than they are? It, it's really, I, I don't want it, to, it's really amazing how awful people can be to other people when they're in a position of authority and don't have to deal with the fact that those other people have a life. Um, so so the, the point of the paradigm is to try to get away from this merry-go-round. Languages compete for scarce resources. Although a language is not an organism, there is a continual struggle for survival among its populations. There is a competition for finite budgetary resources to feed new projects and sustain existing ones. This, there is a competition to reproduce in the minds of new generations of programmers. Everyone wants to be the center of attention. And we fight for it. And the fighting is not very pleasant. If you really listen to anybody talk about another language, or other programmers, they're always denigrating them. They're always saying, this is us, we're good, this is them. They're either obsolete, they're dumb, they're stupid, they're X or Y or Z. I, you know? So language wars are virtually blood both in tooth and claw. All languages resist extinction. Typically, the language leaders at some point cease resisting and rather attempt to readapt. The first thing you say about a new language is, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's special case. We, don't, we could do it ourselves. When it gains some level of popularity, or worse, it seems to be hot, or people want to use it, then what you do is you say, oh, well, then we'll simply have to adapt to it. We'll have to come up with our answer to it. 
For example, we'll add a lambda function. That way we'll, we'll put off the Haskell people. Uh, I, you know, C Sharp added, the people at C Sharp can't figure out that if you pass a, a, a value by reference, it can be null. But apparently that's one of the biggest bugs in C Sharp programming, that they don't think to test for a null. And now you have to test integers for null. I, I, you know, it's great if you're doing database and you want to bring in an entire um, thing automatically, but, but you know, it really puts a strain on programmers, traditional programmers. In any case, this can backfire, emphasizing its current maladaption to the new environment. The population of a language constricts when it fails to reproduce in the mind of new members of the community. Dropping below a certain threshold is no longer of critical mass to command finite budgetary resources. So you find niche places where you need it, right? There are always going to be places where you need C coders, right? There are always going to be places where you need COBOL programmers. There's always going to be places where you need C++ programmers or Fortran programmers. Lawrence Livermore, I was talking to someone here, uh, we said, you know, they have code that's Fortran. And, you know, Bjarne used to have a big fight. Whenever someone at Bell Labs would say, well, I have to do this algorithm in Fortran, I can't trust C++, that would, that, you know, he would then go and he would demonstrate that we could beat Fortran at anything. Uh, but what he, what he didn't understand is that what he, we couldn't beat them at is comprehensibility. If you're a real Fortran person and a mathematician, you don't want to learn C++ syntax just so because it's, it's a better language, because it, it's not better for you. Okay, so... So finally, language is often a unit of deployment. A language is often used as a vehicle for the deployment of a new programming model. That is, of a new paradigm. It tends to, you know, and, and Bjorn and I always thought had a very coherent way of explaining the development of block structured languages. You go from a procedural language to an abstract data type language, then to an object based language uh, or an abstract data type as opposed to data abstraction, where you have a separation of interface and data. And then you add object oriented principles, which are our, our inheritance and subtyping. And then after that, it gets rather confusing. Do we have component model? or I don't really think we have a coherent model at the moment. But um, um, a new language is always going to have to allow you to do something that you can't do with the older language. If you can do that, you can gain new users. The problem is, is that if it's really an elegant language, it's not going to be able to support anything that falls outside of that, that paradigm. And so as things change because of new technology or new demands, you're not going to be able to handle it. Bjarne always handled it by adding a new feature to the language or a new component of the language. The, the only problem I thought about that is, is that they all got interconnected and it's always very confusing because if you copied something by value and it was a reference, everything went kaflui. And, and you had to deal with copy constructors and all sorts of things that made no sense to other things. And then you had templates, which nobody... EDG came the closest to having a sane instantiation mechanism. But basically, at one time, I mean, JPL, one guy that I, I knew and helped, almost got fired because he didn't realize what the uh, GCC instantiation mechanism would do. And he ended up having such slow code for code that was supposed to go in a spacecraft because he, was, he had such a huge footprint of instantiated methods that were duplicated, et, et cetera. So, so template instantiation is a, was a significant problem. Uh, but so you get a simple and elegant language, but it often means re relinquishing the past. One of the most interesting comments when I first read uh, the molecular biology of the cell is pointing out that 
the, the same genetic code that works with 3.5 billion year old bacteria can still work with the most modern or 500 million year old genome. So they don't have a compatibility issue, the life code. We have to move towards that. We don't have any compatibility that I can see with, you know, certainly not between generations. We keep throwing away all our, our best resources. The m biggest problem in industry is that most code becomes unmaintainable because there aren't a, a group of people that want to or know how to even read it, which is fine for older people. Like I got, I, I got to work on um, Menvi, which is uh, Pixar's wonderful animation system, because it's written in a cross of C and early C++, and most people coming out of school looking at it says, that's not code. That's just nonsense. And so they can't understand it, and they don't respect it, and they don't want to look at it. All they want to do is change it. It's like somebody argued, remember in the previous world, that's C code. Where's the class abstraction? But, you know, it's like everybody looks for what's familiar or what they know is canonically good as opposed to what now is bad. And we have a, an awful way of doing that just because it's new, right? Just because it's new doesn't mean it's better. Just because we believe something doesn't mean it's true, right? I mean, but we're built just to accept all that. So, over time, what you notice, or you notice a pattern, is that when there's a reinvention of the dominant program model, there is also a programming language extinction. The current generation of languages has no vocabulary to directly express the new model. Adding the vocabulary compromises the elegance of the original purity of design. A pure language moves from a youthful development community to acknowledge design influence. That's the worst thing that you could be told. Well, you were really important in my youth, right? People tell me about my book. Well, you know, I learned everything I needed to know about C++ with the second edition of the primer. I actually have never touched your book after that. OK. Uh, so the passionate sweeping in and hangdog slinking out of programming language has taken its toll socially on the professional programming class. If you're a list programmer, a common list programmer, you believed in that language. You know, and now nobody even knows that it existed. If you're a small talk programmer, you thought this was grand. It changed Apple, it changed the world. But you can't use it anymore, and nobody respects you for it. They don't want to talk to you about it. Um, you know, so you're just an outcast. You're nobody. Um, I don't think it's working. I don't really want to see my kids. I mean, luckily, my kids aren't going to go into coding. But <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what a father never wants their kids to follow in his footsteps. Almost no children. Like John Up, almost no, Kingsley Amos has a son who, who writes. Most writers whose children write, or most actors whose children act, they're never as good as their parents because their parents had to invent it and learn it and fight. Whereas the children, they get a free ride, right? I can get, I, if my son wanted to code, I'm sure I could pull strings. I can't pull strings for myself, but I could pull strings for my son if that came to that. Um, so I don't think it's working, and I really, I'm 63, I'll be dead soon, right? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's, it's a life cycle, it's okay. You know, the thing is, when you get old, you have to realize, you shouldn't feel bad about it, you want closure, you want to say, there's a trajectory to your life. You can do certain things at 20, you can do certain things at 40, and you should do certain things at 60. And, and just accept the cycle. Don't fight it, it's just how things work. If you didn't, things would have to stop. We'd be too cluttered. Uh, so what kind of solutions suggest themselves? Or where can we go from here? Uh, 
The one model that I like and don't like is C++ itself. C++ has been surprisingly successful because its ability to support multiple program models. The problem why it's been surprisingly unsuccessful is because there's an absence of a unifying architecture and crafted boundaries. The, the, the different paradigms merge into each other and it's easy to confuse them. You slice off, you think you're doing inheritance and but you have a by value class and so suddenly the base class gets sliced off or the the the, um, the derived class gets sliced off which is always perplexing or you you don't realize that pointers have reference semantics and not value semantics when you copy them um, so so what we need I think is a conscious design one that is quantifiable and can handle complex systems. What you don't want is you don't want arguments by authority. And you don't want egos. You don't want people to do something simply because, well, someone said I couldn't do it, so I'm going to do it. Thank you. Um, I mean, there's just too many. I, 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 you know, I've seen a lot of real great people, right? And they do things totally arbitrary. They don't know what the consequences are because they don't have to face them. And ultimately, they just make a decision because they can. I see it in Microsoft with the C-sharp guy. I saw it with Bjarne. I saw it with Bertrand Myers. Even Guy Steele, who I admire, no end. Everybody has an agenda. You can't get away from it. And we can't, you know, that's what I like about the, if you will, the free software um, movement is because it's, it's a more democratic, if you take away Stallman. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> well, yes, but it's not legal. <laughs> Uh, I, this is a stupid name. Uh, I just like IDA. Uh, analytics is really a big thing. Isomorph, isomorphic thinking actually comes from uh, something uh, Stephen Pinker, Pinker wrote in uh, um, The Stuff of Thought, which is actually a wonderful book. Um, but it's a way of, you know, we don't want to say, well, we can compare the brain to the computer because you can only take it that far, so far. But, but a really isomorphic way of thinking allows you to have a correspondence, which is a mathematical thing that you can evaluate and, and, and grade. And also say, so you can, if two people come up with an isomorph for concurrency and synchronization, you could actually evaluate them independently of the people or their arguments based on a point-by-point -point comparison if the, the field that you're looking at is well understood and, and significantly complex. And so hard science is really, to me, the only complex systems that are interesting because they weren't designed by people, they work, and the complexity is simply because we, if you drill down into any complex system, be it the brain or um, the <laughs> genome, or the metabolism of cell. It's really very simple. If you find the right model, it's very simple, but it solves impossibly hard problems. And the solution is always unexpected. For example, who would have thought that the correct solution to the genome is to put a copy in every cell? None of us would have done that, right? If it's the exact same representation of a string, right? We'd have one single constant somewhere, right? I mean, w nobody would do that. And then the problem is that string is so big that you have to compress it so basically difficult that, that it becomes one of the serious problems when you want to express a gene. But that also makes it a way of regulating it. So all these examples are things that none of us would think of out of the blue because they don't they go contrary to engineering sense 
So that's why I always move towards the hard sciences if I want to understand complexity and synchronization. Because anyone that just tries to make something up is just going to give you their bias based on where they are in their education, what they have done, right? Because we all code what we know. We don't invent solutions. If something works, we tag it emotionally, it becomes salient to our experience, and we go back to it again and again. It's very difficult not to keep repeating yourself. And repeating yourself just makes you boring. The thing I always say is, the first time you do anything, anything can happen. Because, you know, but the more you do the same thing, the more you're just going to get into the law of averages. Right? You're always going to go from a unique experience to the statistical mean. Right? You throw three heads, you never, three coins, you never know what that sequence is going to be. But if you throw 10,000 of them, you can almost guarantee it'll be 5,000, 5,000. Okay? So there's a certain point where if you keep doing the same thing, you're predictable and dull. And, and you really should be retired. One of the benefits of, of breaking up at and is we got rid of people that thought they had a job for life and didn't have to work anymore. Okay? I mean, the, 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 the thing about seniority and the thing about academics is you're, you're rewarded for your success and you're not rewarded for what you're doing currently. And therefore, you tend to see new things as threatening. I mean, so most of the cases, the first thing that happens when you go into a company is if you have a, a good mentor, as they say, don't make any suggestions for about six months, because if you do, people are going to get upset with you. Okay? Because they don't, you don't have a track record. And, and they think you're just going to throw things out because you're impatient and you don't, you don't have any, um, etc. So let me, let me quickly go through the rest of the foils here. I'm going to make three statements. Roger Penrose and Plato, to the contrary, the rational is imaginary. You cannot be rational about the physical world. Atoms are one, two, three, infinity, right? That's what you would get from a purely mathematical thing. One proton, one electron, two protons, two electrons, three pro etc., right? To infinity. You would argue that there is no limit to the number of atoms you can have. But in real life, as soon as you put two protons together, you have a significant problem because they want to rip each other apart. So you have to have a neutron. And then the problem is, is that after a certain number of protons, it doesn't matter if you have a neutron or not, it decays because it's just unstable. There's no such thing as infinity in nature, but there is in math. So almost everything that you get from a top-down design is wrong as it gets complex because we don't understand that we're dealing with a physical world that has constraints. You can only get to anything that works bottom-up, in my opinion, be and not just my opinion, because what happens is, is as soon as you make a decision at the bottom, you constrain what can happen following that. So, and that's why you never have an infinite number of choices. As soon as you, I mean, if just think about, we're told that atoms are, you have a negative charge and a positive charge. Well, that's not true, right? Because an, a positive charge and a negative charge is a positron and a, an electron, and they annihilate each other, and that happens all the time. You know, that's what physics say happens all the time. And they don't count it because they pop in and they, they go out. It's only when you get a proton, which is three quarks, that you suddenly get what are called orbitals. I mean, the only way that you get atoms is when you get three quarks that join together. And so suddenly you have a positive um, electrical charge that creates orbitals. The whole quantum mechanics comes out of a... Uh, a proton because these three uh, quarks have actually um, 
join together in an internal space. And that internal space allows for an electron to have an, an orbital, which allows for electromagnetic, which allows for the physical universe that we exist in. And that, that physical universe is constrained by the nature of, of, of the physics. Okay? You can't have um, 114 protons stuck inside of a, of, of a nucleus. It just doesn't work. Um, so top-down reasoning fails before the material world. And that's usually the reason why nothing works very long in, in, in engineering. The other thing is Zeno's paradox. The, the classic case of Zeno's paradox is you're sitting in a chair and you, you, the door's over there and you, you know, our mind is used often to project how we could do something, and you say, well, if I, if I want to get to the door, first I have to get halfway to the door. If I want to get halfway to the door, first I have to get a quarter of the way to the door, and you keep breaking it down, and you have an infinite regress, and you decide, well, I just can't do it. And so you never even try to reach the door. Right? The two mistakes are, one, there's no such thing as an infinite regress, and two, there's no such, I mean, you can't think through a physical problem. The only, you know, the only way you can reach the door is to get up and, and move. If you try to think it through, you're not going to be able to do it. You can't think through. At a certain point in any design, you have to code something and see how it behaves. You can't just do the entire thing as an architecture. That's one of the reasons Microsoft is so screwed up, because they separate architects and implementers, as if in a platonic way. You know, you have the, just like in, 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 in Greek, you'd have the doctor that would stand on a stage and tell you about the body, and then a slave would actually slice the person up and, and show you the, the physical body, because that was considered beneath the, the, the ideal. So, um, and again, this is a simple and silly example, but the fact is, I, I know, I, I, was, I had a good friend at Microsoft who was a mathematician, and I asked him why he left math for coding. And he said, well, you know, I went through it and decided I couldn't possibly be a great mathematician. You know, but you can't know that. You really can't know what you can do until you try. And, and you can only try if you can't not try. If you know that you can fail, and it won't be catastrophic, you'll fail, because it won't matter. Because to actually succeed at something that's really hard, it means you have to do more than you know how to do or anyone else knows how to do. And you won't believe you're capable of it. You'll only do it if you have no other choice. For example, what I'm trying to do with that silly novel, I, I have no idea how to do it. I have no idea how to do this talk. But I, I, and, and I failed to do it, you know, in Shanghai, and people laughed at me. And you may all be laughing at me now, but the point is, if you don't try, you'll never know. And it doesn't matter if you fail. Everybody fails. Every piece of software is no good at some level. It's good enough to work. But we make our livings by, by fixing things, right? By consulting, by helping people. So, and then the modern mathematicians think they prove Zeno's paradox by exploiting the concepts of infinite series. But that's not the, really the answer. They just, they're just going down a garden path. It's just another merry-go-round. Um, okay, so, so what's isomorphic analytics? Uh, the name is awful. Uh, how can we think about complexity without falling into Zeno's paradox and the antagonism it engenders, right? I mean, the problem is that if both of us sit down to think of a, a solution, we're not going to come up with the same solution, and it's going to be difficult for us to agree. If you look at the Standards Committee, everybody fights, and it's always going to be the person who gets the authority. 
I mean, there was a, I, again, I don't, there, there was somebody that insisted and spent a year with the core language group to deal with template instantiation, right? You, you define a template here, and there's a set of variables that are noticeable where the template is defined. And then you instantiate it here, and there's a set of variables that are known at the instantiation. And how do you resolve that? They spent a year where they pretty much exclusively dealt with that. It got a fancy name. It got written up. I never even understood it. And then when I was at Microsoft, Herb Sutter was sitting in an opposite office. And he, office and he tried to work through it and he found that it was wrong and, and they had to throw it away and, and then they, they changed the name of it because it was an embarrassment and when I asked somebody what happened they blamed it on C semantics <laughs> which is that's what Bjarne always does well the language isn't you know one token look ahead because of C Every, everything that's wrong with C++ is because of C. But if it wasn't for C, C++ never would have been used. So, again, think of temperature before Kelvin. Either you had Fahrenheit or you had Celsius. And people argued, right? Well, Celsius is, is so much more rational. It uses, you know, a 0 to 100. Isn't that grand? For, for that. You know, and Kelvin was the only one that anchored it in something real, and now we know the temperature is simply the movement of, of, of molecules. It's, it is the only rational way of actually defining temperature in a way that is completely useful and you never have to change it again. So isomorphic reasoning is an attempt to anchor design to a quantitative physical model found in nature. The value of the isomorph is quantifiable. We can order isomorphic thinking about a problem without resorting to authority. Because what you want is, I mean, I'm not well educated. I didn't go to a great school. My parents were blue collar. My father wasn't even born here. So he, you know, he had to work. Uh, he was a printer. He, he was, he, you know, so right off the bat, nobody listens to me. Um, because I, I don't have the, you know, the credentials. I don't, you know, so you want some way to allow people to speak up if they have a good idea. You want a competition that is based on what you do, not on who you are. That, I mean, to me, that's what you want. Of course, if you are somebody, that's not what you want at all. You want to exclude people that, because then you're, you're, you don't have to be challenged. Uh, the isomorph is invariant across space, but mutable over time. It is only based on the b amount of knowledge we have at the moment. So we can always adapt it. But the point is, is we have a constant that we can always talk about that's the same for everyone. We don't have that with C++. There's not one person in this room that agrees with another person completely about the nature of templates in C++, about what happens to them, how you should best use them, and it'll always be a fight. There'll be people that'll stand up in front of you and tell you what to do, and you might try to do it, but there's no reason to actually believe them. So it doesn't work. Um, so again, I, so I wanted to use fertilization, and I'm not going to get very far with this. So, so the question then is, what are you talking about, isomorphic analytics? Uh, you just throw that out? So here's the, here's the argument. Natural design is complex, right? It's really hard to understand how the brain works or how the genes work. But the fact is, it isn't if you put the work into it. Okay? Once you understand it, The world is different. I mean, you just, nothing is mysterious. I mean, okay, you understand why people do the things they do or why things are the way they are. So you have to put an investment of time, but once you get on the other side of that, you have a common vocabulary and things don't change in, 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 a, 
in the accelerated way, the technology and language and, 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 if you will, the hottest design changes. How many people have, you know, followed a design pattern that ends up being useless, right? Uh, or, or just arbitrary. I mean, how many of the design patterns in the, the design pattern book are really just based on graphics? I mean, that's because that's where they came from, right? And then you had something like the singleton. The singleton was a wonderful design pattern if you were on a single machine. But if you go to the web, the singleton is what, probably one of the worst bottlenecks you can deal with. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually... Um, transport across domains. So what you want is a way of being able to think about domains like the web in a way that you can think in a non-personal, non-cultural way. You, and, 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 whatever, okay. Um, it exists at four independent but tightly coupled levels that are complex in themselves, yet also built upon what is below it. It spans the micro scale, the macro scale. That's the biggest problem that we have in every domain. It's certainly the problem, you know, when we're on, a, on the web, we're not in the machine, but ultimately we have to deal with the machine as well. We have to deal with the micro scale at some times, and we have to deal with the macro scale, and sometimes we just have to deal with people's psyche, both as people that program and as people that manage. Right? So everything has to be dealt with. And, and we'd like to be able to synchronize it across all four. Right now we synchronize on a level, but we can't synchronize across levels. Right? The, the, the biggest problem as a compiler writer is, I want to be able to know what the assembler or what the machine code or the runtime is doing in relation to what I wrote, not what is... is been changed, right? I, I want to sometimes go down to the machine level and say, this is critical. I want to be able to control that. And we can't do that. There's not one compiler system that even attempts to do that. There was some research at Microsoft, but, but again, it became political. You couldn't get the high-end people and the low-end people to talk because they both felt they had different agendas. And they had different people that they had to, to, to um, uh, placate. Thank you. Um, and, and the thing about this is there's all sorts of isomorphs to be applied. Any of you could find one that's interesting. You could, there's so many things that you can use that it's not like anyone is telling you which one to use or anything. And that's, that was part of the reason I used fertilization, partly as a joke, but also because fertilization is real important because at the level of us, it, it drives almost everything we do, right? I mean, you can't possibly look at one commercial that doesn't basically sell what they're doing by either sex or fear. <laughs> Right? You're, you know, you're, 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 I mean, whatever. So, what I wanted to do is come up with something that's completely open-ended. I'm, I'm offering you a, a mechanism or a heuristic without attaching myself to it or telling you what to do or saying it's done. I'm just simply saying, this I think is a pathway it needs the work of a community of people, an international community of people, and generations. It's just trying to build an infrastructure that we can keep, rather than just keep throwing it away every generation, and fight about and attack each other's humanity. But again, I, I can't prove it. You know, it, you just either accept it or you don't. So what about fertilization? I just want to quickly go, and I'm going to run out of time. Uh, four levels. At the level of the cell cycle, five minutes, OK. At the level of the cell cycle, what is fertilization? 500 million years ago, a new kind of cell cycle was invented, which called meiosis, which allowed um, an egg to just stop right in the middle. Right? It, it just generates so much, and then it stops, 
and it waits for a certain event. And that certain event, it, 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 it only has one set of chromosomes, and it needs a second set. That's what sex is, right? To the, the joining of two chromosomes. And all it cares about is that one event. That's its entire thing that it's waiting for. And everything above that is an implementation detail. Right? So again, um, it needs, you know, and it's really an interesting thing. It needs a cell mechanism within the egg to bring the second set of chromosomes to a one-to-one -one mapping. Then it has to invent an algorithm for recombining the chromosomes, right? Because every, every person has a unique recombination of their parents' genes. So no people are the same. And that, that was important for a number of reasons, partly just for pathogen, because we, we live in a, a, a microscopic world where everything's attacking us. Um, and the patterns in this implementation, gradient, receptor, regulatory proteins, a chemical state machine, it's a completely self-contained model. And, it, and, and, and it, it works at the, uh, the metabolic or cellular level. And, and again, it, what's important is, is that it's typeless. The mechanism to stop and start the cell cycle is more or less invariant with the codependent aspects encapsulated in the genome to be, to be developed. The mechanism itself is a kind of Lisp engine parameterized by the genome, or family of genomes. It is a complete and independent system. The actual delivery system is implementation detail. It has its own physics, time scale, and constraints. Its own vocabulary and domain space. And it imposes constraints on everything above it. Okay. You can't have just any arbitrary delivery system. It has to deliver that one particular set of chromosomes. That means it has to come up with a, an identity system. And it has to do an identity system where it doesn't know that 500 million years later, it may actually come up with species that it never imagined. Um, so there's not an unconstrained solution space for the delivery system. That's what makes it natural design. Um, and there's nothing centrally human about it because it's bottom-up and conservative. And it's in this space where the mouse, mushroom, and milkweed become one. There's no difference at, the, at this level between them. I, I'm, I'm going to have to... Thank you. Um, so in order to carry out fertilization between animals, bodies emerged. All existing body plans were said to emerge during the Cambrian explosion about 500 million years ago. Uh, in any case, bodies developed within a species such that one body form receives the set of chromosomes, and we, let's call that the host. And then the other body form um, generates the chromosome set to be delivered, call it the packet. There's a huge amount of concurrency and synchronization, and even more invention that needs to be accomplished here. Just think about how you would solve that. And I'm just giving some examples. You need to invent a mechanism for projecting cells out of one body form and being received in the others. There's lots of different ways. With fish, they just shoot them both out into the water. But think about that. That, that means that there has to be synchronization of the two because of the water currents and diffusion. And that, you know that there are problems with that. So you know, eventually you get to to what we know. But you know, I wanted to cast this without any use of the word sex or gender. I did run out of time. Sorry. Okay. You need to invent a cell that can be modal, right? It can move, carry its chromosome set, and be equipped with the protein munitions necessary to pro to. Uh, penetrate the egg's membrane. So you need to invent a mechanism to identify an incoming packet as being the right sort of packet. You know, and that's always, I, you know, identity is a real problem in computation, right? What, what makes two particular things the same? Yes? Uh, 
And so you have a real problem. Like, see, as, as I was going to say, the, you have to entirely invent a new cell cycle. Uh, a genome is going to contain a polymorphic, like, up until multicellular organisms, the genome only had the set of proteins it needed for that mechanism, right? It was a, it was a, you know, a non-polymorphic set. Uh, and I'll remember to do the question. Uh, but suddenly, with multicellular, you had a, a, a genome that you only use a subset of. So now you have to have a complete new mechanism to deal with that. Uh, and it's an independent level, and it has to be represented at the level of the genome. Uh, the genome suddenly must develop the form and control the function. The earlier reg blah, 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 blah. So where are we? I'm sorry. I, tell me when to stop. Or just walk out on me. That's cool. Uh, we've looked at two independent levels operating at the micro scale, the cellular and the chemical. Uh, while, each is while each is self contained, they're tightly coupled. Each operates in a different framework with its own physical and scale of time, physics and scale of time. But we can coordinate the two, we can synchronize the two and, and develop a correspondence between them. Okay. And then all I do in the second part, which I'm not going to go through, is go to the macro level now. So, um, and, and I, you know, and I, I deal with the nervous system and then I deal with uh, the, the body. Um, let me just quickly go. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I should have. Um, zip, zip, zip. You'll have these. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So, are you, what you're doing is providing isoprotein from the uh, way these things work um, uh, Yes. The, the question is, where am I going? What, what's the point of all this? <laughs> Uh, so let me just say, you know, so I came up with two independent operating at the macro scale and um, the, the mechanical and the sentient, meaning that there's the mechanical or body and then there's the sentient or the, the, the cognitive or the creative, the analytical. Um, and again, each is self-contained but tightly coupled and, and they're built on the other one. So what does that lead us to? What I call a metaphor schematic. I, forgive me for the horrible graphic. I don't know if you can read this. But, but from a purely biological, I, I would claim there's cognitive and emotional behavioral. Insects and mice just operate on this. Cognitive requires learning. Uh, then you have the phenotype which is the structure, the data structure, and then you have the genome, which is the code. Okay. So, and then I'm saying you can synchronize these, but you have to deal with the fact that there is a, a refractory level where things change because you're going from a micro scale to a macro scale. Okay, you know, which is just levels of abstraction. And then to... And, and so my claim is, is that you can, the, the idea of an isomorphic thing is then you can apply it to your own domain. So here I'm making a metaphor program scheme, and I realize the colors are awful. But I'm saying there's a dynamic runtime which we have to deal with, which Java starts doing in Objective-C, not Objective-C, but um, other runtime language. And we have the static compilation model, you know, the C and whatnot. And then we have the machine state and we have the machine code. So again, I'm just pushing this into that and claiming you can make reasonable isomorphisms between the two, reason about them using the natural science, and then apply them to this. 
using experts within the field to determine quantitatively how close is the model. But it's a way of objectively thinking about it and having discussion without getting involved in implementation or cultural details that will only create antagonism. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because a mathematical model, uh, he's asking me why use a physical model rather than a mathematical model, because there's no mathematical models for most of hard science, except for physics. Uh, but you don't have one for neuroscience. You don't have one for uh, the genome. And those are the two that are most closely related to programming. Uh, if you read uh, Koch, uh, biophysics of computing. He's at Caltech in Pasadena. You know, he makes, you know, he has, you know, he, he compares uh, the synapse and circuits with, um, um, with electrical systems. I mean, he makes a one-to-one -one mapping. And then if you read something like the synaptic organization of the brain, you'll see that by Shepard, you'll see, and others, you'll see that there are, there are families of circuits. And, and so there actually is. And then again, with the brain, I mean, there are, there are actual, um, you, can, you can basically do a really, and I mean, to me, the reason I find them interesting is because I like computation and, and, you know, deep down, you know, like I like to actually machine code, write, write firmware. Uh, so there is that level of correspondence, plus it's natural. I find it really natural to read about the genome or to read about the brain because I, I'm a computational person. I've been coding for 30 years. So, you know, I tend to think that way in any case. Okay. And what you understand is that everything is a finite state machine. Development and behavior, at least through mice, is a finite state machine. You can actually, and I could give you a, a, a book that actually breaks down the mating of, of mice as a purely mechanical, chemical state. So again, the schema is invariant and fully specified for the isomorphic domain. It is modular to a specified extent, allowing for swapping out. That's the classic idea of a framework. It is surrounded by software layers that allow development either vertically or horizontally. So, so this is the, the key. And each layer has its own language domain and domain abstraction. So you're not trying to force things into places they don't belong. And within the constraints of the schema, the software layers provide multi-tiered abstractional functionality. So to give you the, the again, it's a horrible picture. These are meant to be abstraction layers that can provide, I mean, to me, if I was, you know, when I thought this was just a boost conference, I was going to say, you know, you could templatize this. This is the software layers that interface into these guys. These guys remain invariant, so we have a coding base we can always target. Or we could swap out, but have it, um, labeled and automated so that we know versioning ways of dealing with it. These would be software layers where we can do all our proprietary and, and abstraction and bells and whistles, right? But you want the basic layers to remain invariant or else it's a moving target and we have to throw too many things away. And then we surround it by an interface or an environment and again, where we can provide a view for particular people. Uh, and also, you know, whatever we want here and whatever we want in here. You know, if, if we're just even in, in terms of the uh, security and, and stuff. And we need to be able to synchronize. If we can synchronize across layers and use these software layers, then I think we're, we're moving towards a model that, that could sustain itself beyond our individual careers. Uh, to me, that's what's necessary. I, I just think this is a just, 
you know, I've been in this for 30 years. It's just not working, in my opinion. Yeah. The problem is, you know, this model, I mean, it's kind of assuming that nature has a pretty good model of synchronization. But, yes. But the existence of cancer says, you know, sometimes... No. Actually, if you look at cancer, the current research of cancer, you'd see that it's genetically well-defined. We just... We just don't find it very pleasant. <laughs> okay, but, but, you know, no, we no, don't like it. Oh, he's, he, but, but again, I, I'm not going to argue that. If you want to argue that this is no good, then just do something better. <laughs> to improve on it. This is just a first approximation. Now, again, there's going to be hundreds of objections to this. I can't be persuasive. But my, my challenge to you would be, design a behavioral state machine for mouth-like animals, such that uh, blah, 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 blah. It's a complex system. What will the likely results be? Again, quickly, all of you are smart enough to do it, given enough time and resources if you wanted to. But the problem is, is that every one of you is going to do it differently. <laughs> and so what's going to happen is, is that if it was a professional career trajectory, you're going to fight tooth and nail for yours. You're going to knock the other person. You're not going to be concerned about getting synthesis. You're going to be concerned about winning. I was. I mean, I can be ruthless. If I, if I want to, you know, if somebody's antagonizing me and it's my job that they're trying to get, I'll beat them or else I'll lose. But that's just the nature of people, right? Um, so it's not possible to, I believe, to achieve a coherent design across the computational space-time unless we have some kind of objective or invariant structures that we can agree on and also that map reasonably, quantifiably to the target environments. That's, that's my claim. Um, so, all software is obsoleted within a generation at best. Everything we've managed to implement so far is basically has its own termination date implicit in it. Um, I say let's get off the merry-go-round. Uh, I have. I just couldn't bear to write C++ anymore, just to listen to people arguing about things that we've been arguing about for 20 years. We don't have a solution for, for static initialization. Uh, I understand my thing falls short. It's the best I could come up with on my own. I was just, I wanted to see what I could do. Uh, so do something better. But just don't do it for yourself. Do it for the community. Because ultimately, we're all, either, you know, the world's not doing so great. So I think we have a responsibility. Um, you know, we say it's computer science, but we don't treat this as science. We treat it as a, as a little arena for ourselves and our friends. So let's all work concurrently and synchronize, and maybe we can all build something that's both complex and coherent against lo across locale and still allow for inventiveness and competition. And that's really all I wanted to say. I, I don't have, you know, an answer, but I, I don't think uh, what we're doing is good enough. Sorry to take so much time. Thank you. Thank you, Stan. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so I actually have a question about your idea of the bot. Oh, this is handy. This, this makes me audible to everybody, which is kind of scary. Um, so, so I, I'm not going to use this. Um, so, I, oh. so, so I have a question about um, your, your idea of this bottom up approach. Yeah. Um, basically, your bottom up approach involves um, identifying the bottom in the physical realm, but how do you how do you identify the bottom of the physical realm, or do you have to have a constraint on that? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, most 
For example, we, we were doing a playback system in animation. So the bottom line was it had to play back at at least 24 frames a second. You know, and there was an existing set of, of hardware that we needed to, to operate on. And, and there was, you know, we had to use OpenGL. I mean, there was a, there was a fundamental set of, of criteria that we had to operate on. The same with JPL or the Mars rover. The Mars rover ultimately is a machine with four wheels, not four wheels, but a, a, a way to move on the ground, a way to see the environment. And those are your, that's the bottom up. The, the, it, it's constrained by, for example, in our, we were using Linux at the time, so they didn't have Firewire and they had no digital support for, for you know, converting from paper. So we had to deal with that as, as the bottom level. So, so are you suggesting that the, the, the definition of where the bottom is in, in your problem or in your solution is the very first constraint that you have to specify before you can come up with or before you can identify the other constraints? Uh, yes, I'm saying that. Are you still you have to do it bottom up in terms of the running program because it has to exhibit certain kinds of behavior and it can only do that within the constraints of, of you can't make it run faster than the slowest you know there's always going to be a bottleneck uh, and that bottleneck is what allows you to do other things like for example as I used to say to people the visual C++ over the web or cross.net you don't have the same physics of performance they were trying to do optimizations you know see optimizations that made no sense in a web context so they were they were providing optimizations that nobody wanted but but they they only understood them in terms of c let me interrupt you to make some announcements and then yes no. have questions sure First announcement is we're going to push back the next session by 10 minutes. The next session, we we'll push back. See, I'm disruptive. Oh, well, we'll be back on schedule after lunch. So lunch will be a little short. Break will be a little short, too. Uh, I, do, I do also want to announce that uh, uh, we'll be having leftovers from the picnic at lunch if you want to do that. And I do want to ask really quickly uh, uh, to show some support for the for Patty and the volunteers and the cooks last week. Remember to take the microphone from me because I don't want to take it home with me. Uh, did I answer your... Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, but it's at such a high level of abstraction that it doesn't mean anything. See, if you're going to do this, you have to do the work, right? I mean, you can't base a, an isomorphism on DNA goes to M, uh, RNA goes to protein because that, that is actually meaningless. It doesn't really say anything. If you, for example, if you wanted to talk about DNA, you have to start from the fact that it's that it's a chemical backbone of, of, of phosphate and sugar and that there's four nucleotides and that they have to have precursors because you have to be able to construct them and there's all sorts of the details are are, are what matters just as when you implement something you know ultimately you have to understand the domain if, if it's animation you have to understand graphics you have to understand Well, yeah. Um, 
you know, I don't really have an, an answer for you. What I'm trying to say is, again, if you're doing a simple thing, it's, there's no reason to do anything different. If you're trying to write a complex system, like to run a, a spacecraft or to even manage the, the web or to do animation, you know, anything that's really interesting and hard, um, and nobody's done it before, how do you even think about it? Because I've seen most, most uh, thinking in design is, you know, like Kent Beck's Agile programming. You just hack something together, it works, and then you're just responsive to the bugs until you can't be responsive anymore, and then you throw it away and you get another one. That, that really is exhaustive and works if you don't have to live in the company, if you're just a consultant, because it looks like you're getting great results. Um, I, I look at, you know, I saw the way Bjarne designed templates. I mean, it was, a, it was really hasty pudding. And, and people suffer for that. You know, in industry, every problem with C++ causes a failure. For example, we were doing animation and didn't realize, because we were using shared memory, and we tried to put objects in shared memory. And I didn't realize that you can't put a, a virtual table in shared memory because all the addresses are going to be wrong unless you physically, you know, uh, we were using silicon graphics at the time, so we could map it. But, it, you know, and I, I, I pulled Bjarne aside once when he visited Disney, and I said, hey, you know, this is really significant. Is, is there a solution? And he never got back to me. He never even considered the idea that shared memory and virtual functions just don't work. And, and you know, but they won't. You see, the thing is, is that if you read anything that, that a language designer or a software person does, they only show you what's easy. They only show you what works. You know, and it's when you get, you know, you buy into that and you're all enthusiastic and you put yourself at risk in your company. And it fails because of something you depended on being there that you assumed somebody else, else had thought about. And they had no reason to care. And they're not going to be there when you fail. You know, I, I, I screwed up at Disney because I, I thought you could put something in shared memory that was, that was more than just a struct. And, and so, I, you know, I lost my... I was principal software engineer. But, you know, I, I had to take a back seat. I had to swallow my pride. You know, you, you don't get a second chance in industry. You know, they'll give you a shot. You know, the way it works in, the way it works in computing is, or in most things is, you, nobody knows who you are. You do something. If you get people's attention and it works, they'll give you something harder to do. If you succeed, they'll give you more. You'll keep going until you screw up or else you secure a position where nobody can touch you. And once nobody can touch you, then you're corrupt, in my opinion, because you're constantly trying to defend yourself. That's true of Alex. That's true of Bjarne. Bjarne screwed up the, the C++11 because he was frightened of certain modern concepts. Alex, as soon as you say anything about the fact that lists don't really work well with uh, um, STL, he'll tell you that you're an idiot and you should shut up. And, and, you know, I mean, why? Because it's his life work at that point. I, I'm, not, I'm not complaining about these people. It's the way you are. You know, once you have a family and a position and a really good salary, you're not going to let go of that for anyone, right? I, there's no such thing as truth or, or untruth once you, you're, you know. I, it's, it's, you know, it's just the way things are as far as I've seen. In, in every industry. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, may, may I suggest totally? We can just walk away. Yes. Take it offline. Yeah. Uh, break is almost over. I'm sorry. Let's stop at that point. Uh, thanks again. Yeah. Thank